one. Well, folks, we made it through the CPI number. They bought the dip. Little, little over a 60-point trading range over the last five sessions heading into a quad witch. Reaching the top of that trading range today or earlier in the session. Do we have enough momentum to get through? Well, Mark Chaikin at 8.15, help us evaluate that. Of course, we'll be covering some news, some news bombs hitting the tape, Netflix and Amazon. It's Thursday. It's pre-market prep. Let's get it started. Coming to you live from downtown Detroit, this is Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep. With your host, Joel Conan. This is a volatile puppy here, isn't it? And Dennis Dick. I'm bidding a penny. I'd buy that stock for a penny. With everything you need to start your trading day. All right, good morning, traders and investors. We're starting out in the green by 15 and a half handles after that wicked rally in the last 30 minutes of the session. 15.75 and the handles were up at 45.33 and a quarter. The buck backing off that uh, major resistance at 105. It's down just a penny at uh, 104.38. Bonds in the red by a quarter point, 119 and 14, 30 seconds. Could up a buck 36 trying to get into that $90 handle uh, up at 89.88. Gold in the red by 320 at 1929.10. Silver sub 23 down 33 cents at 22.84. And Bitcoin uh, holding those days from the last few sessions. Bitcoin up $315 at 26,520. Well, Triple D, they uh, they bought the dip off that number. wasn't much of a dip, and they bought the dip in the last half hour. Strong close. Could you feel that fall through in the after hours, or was it another quiet after hours? No, set? they were buying stocks after hours. You could feel the buying pressure. Lots of stocks getting bid after hours. It was an interesting day, and again, this randomness to this market because there were some stocks that had a pretty decent day, and then there was other stocks that just not did not have a good day at all. I mean, Apple, again, closing week, closing near the lows, not participating much this morning either. Um, the stock is up, but it's struggling here to hold its gains. I mean, a little bit of the hangover from the event, which we predicted correctly on this show that probably you see selling pressure after that. Um, I think you're just in a tail of two markets here right now where you've got, you know, the bulls have really battling with the bears. It's the same thing. And I think we're going to have a lot of chop, but overall, I just, the, the risk is so high in this market. And this is why I continue to hold a lot of cash in the long-term portfolio, because the risk is just almost feels like it's, it's just so high compared to the risk-free rate. When you're talking five and a half, six percent. And then you're talking all these unknowns and you're talking these stocks that are trading at nosebleed multiples, um, certain stocks, not all stocks. I'm just like, I don't know. I'm just like, I want to have some cash because I could see a scenario where we go back to all time highs, but I could also see a scenario where we retest the October lows. And I'm just hmm. not comfortable to be all in when I can't quantify that risk. Hmm. And I, I don't think we're going to either of them. I think. And, and, and that might be the case. Maybe it's just a trading environment and maybe we just continue to chop. And, and that would be good. I mean, for traders, if you can predict those types of environments, you make money because, you know, you're fading moves then. You're not chasing. You're not going with the breakouts. You're fading the breakouts or fading the breakdowns. I mean, that's what is kind of working here. I would say sh sell the rip definitely working a bit better than buy the dip because you see these dips and some of the stocks aren't bouncing back as quickly as you'd hope but i just feel like there's potential tommy lackey you know his word tape bombs coming oh. i feel like you know we got american airlines on guidance and yes that was because of fuel costs but we're gonna get an ecb decision here in a few minutes let's bring on money mitch get his thoughts because i'm very torn well, let's get let's get to those tape bombs that you mentioned from yesterday. It's eight oh six. We got Mark shaking at eight fifteen. Mitch, take us into the news. 
Let's get to those tape bombs. Then we'll go to the, the headlines. Of course, we'll talk arms. Stick around, guys. We'll talk the auto industry. But let's get to those tape bombs that hit. First one, let's get to Netflix stock market roller coaster yesterday. Netflix making headlines as its market capitalization took a major hit. A cautious statement from the CFO, Spencer Newman, sent shockwaves through the market. Netflix expected profit margins ranging from 18 to 20 percent compared to the consensus of 22.1 percent. Let's analyze what this could mean for the streaming giant and its investors. Again, another tape bomb. I mean, there's just seems to be a few of these that it's like, when the random news comes lately, it doesn't feel like it's good news unless it's some product on AI because you know they're still throwing that out. But like <laughs> it's like when the financials come out, it's American Airlines. Oh, we're lowering guy. It's not Netflix. Oh, we're seeing you know issues here. I mean, it just feels like the random news that keeps hitting the tape is been bad news. So I, I don't know. I keep you know, and, and people are saying you know I'm bearish. I'm bearish all the time. There's a big difference, one rant before you guys go on, there's a big difference between bearishness and cautiousness. I'm cautious here. I'm still trading, still in the markets every day. I'm still doing stuff, but I'm investing very cautiously because there's just a lot of unknowns. And I think as an investor, and especially as a trader, it is your number one job first to protect your capital. Second, then start thinking about making money. In this type of environment, there's just a lot of risk. And that's why when I'm getting paid 5.5%, Bank of America coming out yesterday, Joel, and saying there's a lot of money market funds that are you know, at you know all-time highs or you know a lot of money on the sidelines. And all that money is going to come back pouring into the market here potentially by the end of the year. That's what Bank of America was saying. I mean, come on. You know, do some homework. This money that is sitting in these money market funds is getting 5.5%. It's not getting 0.5% anymore. It's not getting 1%. It is getting paid to wait. And here, you know, we're not like, if you just started investing in 2020, you, you got this market in 2020 that just was out of the norm. The markets over the long run produce 7% returns a year. We and can what are we up on a year? You can't, yeah, they're not going to Five and a half percent risk free. So you're taking on all this risk for the potential of an extra one and a half? I mean, if you were just looking at a longer term perspective, like I'd argue almost you're better at five and a half or six percent for the next five years than an unknown market. But, you know, we don't know what's going to happen and there's opportunities. But I just think that money that's sitting on the sidelines isn't that hungry, isn't that starving to come back into this market when it's getting paid five and a half or six percent. Let's go to Visa's you. news. Well, I just wanted to do the technicals real quick on yeah. Netflix. I wasn't sure if that rant was over. Uh, <laughs> it, 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 the uh, the kind of I don't do this much uh, SOH on this one. Sit on hands because Netflix, Netflix. I mean, I see a pair of lows at uh, four oh seven and then four hundred. I don't know if it has the gas to get back, you know, to that low on this news. Coming back on the upside, I just don't think you know when you get these kind of inner day flushes. I mean. All of a sudden, you're long at 435, market's okay, boom, all of a sudden, you're at 420. So it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard for it to go up. I'd be uh, patient to wait for 407 or 400 on the downside. Uh, let's get to Amazon. Amazon, man, they're catching on. All you have to do is mention AI. Amazon is making ways with its generative AI capabilities. Sellers can now streamline their process, creating product descriptions and listings. This innovation promises to provide customers with a more complete and engaging product information. How will this impact the e-commerce giants and its sellers? We'll explore the implications here. Amazon's been hot as of late, and this gets me to maybe want to take a look at shop, but let's talk first Amazon. Then we can take a look at shop. Uh, long Amazon still. It's one of the long, the you know bigger stocks that I still hold in the long term portfolio. Valuation is stretched a bit, but again, they're growing into the valuation. An analyst was saying the other day they think they can make five bucks next year. I mean, so it's trading thirty times, and it's the cheapest Amazon's probably ever been relative yeah. to itself. So you know, you can say it's a nosebleed valuation, looking over forty times, but I think they continue to grow earnings. They start focusing on that bottom line that could come in. So I think it's a sneaky 
you know, not a value stock. It's definitely not a value stock, but relative to itself, it is. Stock is breaking out, making a new 52-week high. What's not to like about that? Um, so I'm happy I'm long. Yeah, it's uh, this one just would not sell off with the market. Uh, you know, coming off the uh, the highs of the move that we had uh, back in, I believe, uh, earlier in August, and this was just kind of stubborn. It's caught a bid. Uh, Morgan Stanley came out after the close and said the stock could have another twenty to sixty percent upside from here. So that tacked on a little juice from that closing print. Now we're at one forty five seventy three. Uh, you might get a look at yesterday's high on the downside if you're looking for really minor support, 144.98. Uh, but this is the highest we've been. Good call, Dennis. In over a year, back in August of 2022, we traded 146.67. We haven't hit that yet in the pre-market. That's just a minor target uh, for this issue. You got to start maybe thinking about we cleared 145. Maybe go to you know the Kenny Glick number. We're going to 150. So maybe we'll, we'll oh, take a look. It works. At. I mean, it works in bull markets for sure, and it works in momentum market. But Kenny Glick is a specialist, and he finds pockets of momentum i mean we love kenny he's come on the show for years all the personality but kenny is an excellent trader we'll give you a shout out there kenny we know you're listening sometimes i mean this is you know just his strategy he finds the pockets of momentum so even when he's in a market where it seems like momentum trades aren't working he finds the pockets of momentum and he uses scanners you know he's looking at you know what movers he's looking at different stuff to do that it's his style of trading I'm a mega cap trader. I've learned from you, Joel, over the years. You know, we always stayed within the S&P 500 for the majority of our trading. Why? Because I don't get tape bombed overnight. My stock doesn't close, open down 50% usually. So unless we're in a COVID crisis here, for the most part, you know, you get a bad day on one of these S&P stocks and it moves down 3 or 4%. You know, it's usually not, you know, really hammered. And I'm a risk manager at best. I'm a risk manager. So... Coming back to the Amazon, coming back to the Netflix. I mean, these are all, you know, stocks that I trade regularly. Some of them going in opposite directions. It's what I'm talking about, this random walk. You know, Amazon's this... making new 52-week highs, but Apple's breaking down to a new two-month high. Yeah, yep. I mean, yep. you got stocks just going in opposite directions that are tech stocks. You know, we grouped all these. They're in FANG. They're grouped all together. And now they're starting to, you know, separate themselves. So did we move into a stock pickers market for the second or last quarter of this year? I think so. Oh, so does disaster. The, yeah, just one more thing. Just liquidity too, Dennis. I mean, that's, that's one what thing. it is for me. Yeah, I mean, you know, you want to move. I Liquid. Mean, you, yeah, I mean. I'm moving be, pretty good size money in and out. I yeah. want to be able to get in and out for like not paying a 10 cent spread when I'm getting yep. in and out. I, come, yep. I trade Bank America every single day. Almost every single day, you know the oh, banks relative to there because they're yep. sitting there with one cent markets. I get in and out. You can move a million bucks worth. Of, not that I'm doing that, but I'm saying you can. You know, usually move five hundred thousand, eight hundred thousand dollars worth of Bank of America in within two cents. I mean, you can't do that on some of these smaller stocks. So, and this is why the small caps, you know, have always been forgotten in this market for a long time too. Is the liquidity is just not there. You got an institutional money manager that's managing billion dollars. Well, they're not buying ten thousand dollars worth of a stock, and we're just getting that news right now from the. I'm going to get my uh, ECB. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. ECB decision. Grant later. Here. ECB now. <laughs> okay. Uh doesn't look like we're moving a whole lot off it. We went it. wide, though. We went, went wide. Okay. We went wide on the EFA. I noticed that. If you want to watch European index index EFA is probably the most liquid one. After hours pre market, you also have IEFA. You also have VGK. So those are the ones that, you know, I'm watching. All right. We'll see what happens here when we get the decision. Will they hike interest rates here? We'll find out when it hits the tape here. I'm looking for it. I'll let you guys know as soon as I see it on the tape. Tape bombs. We're just boom, kind boom, of boom. chilling here on the S&P. Yeah. Yeah. There's not much Let's going see. on here. Up about 15 and a half handles. Uh, I just want to mention, I didn't get to mention this earlier. So we're looking at this 45.38. That's a pre-market high. Uh, we had a daily high a few days ago at 39.50. Um, we had another daily high at 43.50. So we've been in this nifty little tight little 60-point trading range, kind of near the upper end of the trading range. Maybe we'll get a good PPI number to uh, push us through there. 
Uh, but uh, let's let's bring on Mr. Mark Chaikin and get uh, his perspective on the market. He's a he's been pretty spot on here for a while. Good morning, Mark Chaikin, founder of Chaikin Analytics. He joins the show every two weeks to give us his fundamental and technical outlooks on the market. Mark, how you doing today? Good morning, Vietnam. <laughs> what homage, a great movie. That homage movie, to my that, favorite comedian. That and I and he was excellent. I mean, yeah. you know, like obviously passed away a number of years ago here, but you know, we miss him. Robin Williams is killing it. That role, that movie. That was a great movie. Great movie. Really good. I'm we good. don't have we don't have the actors like that anymore, do we? I mean, maybe we're just getting old. Maybe I'm getting older, and I just don't. You know, like the John the John Candy too was just phenomenal too. But Ron Williams, I mean, we lost so many really good actors. We did. Yeah, indeed. Fred Astaire. Oh you know, yeah. Jimmy Stewart. Roy, Roy Rogers. <laughs> Roy Rogers. John Wayne. Okay. All right. Enough of the movie. We talk. better stop talking, or we're just going to yeah. reminisce about past so, actors here. So, Joel, uh, t- two weeks ago or three, it was forty-three fifty, and that held, and now it's forty-four fifty. I love and that it's, number. It's really like simple. It's the seven uh, seventy period moving average. Everybody focuses on the fifty, and so uh, you know, is the fifty going to hold? Is it going to break? Well, it almost always breaks because the seventy is the real support and resistance so and that's 70 work- 70 okay 70 and that's been working for i don't know three four years for me so that's my line in the sand here and uh, it's held pretty much through this whole bull market except for a couple of days yeah that and, was a cool quick dip that quick dip yeah. we had to 44.50 you only had one shot out there to get it right so i my sense of this um interest rate and Fed situation vis-a-vis inflation is that the number came in pretty good yesterday. If it had been, I don't know, three hundredths of a percent lower, they round. I think people don't understand that. It came in at two eight, so they rounded it up to three. Oh my God, it missed. Came in hotter. It was actually 2.8. And if it had rounded, if if it had been 2.5, they would have rounded down to two and the market would have cheered. But the people who looked under the surface saw that there was nothing there. That surprised. So now we've got PPI coming today. And my sense is the Fed is not going to raise. And it's it's your guess as well as mine what that means for the market. They're completely done. They're completely done, you think? I think they're done uh, for the next two rounds. Okay. Um, yeah, there's a small uptick in inflation. Everybody's sort of massaging the uh, the housing effect because it is a lag effect. And some smart people are saying most of that effect is now in the market. But I think the world can live with inflation at 3%, not 2%. Uh, that's just an arbitrary yeah, number. That's, a, and, that's been a common theme that a lot of people, you know, that I've been saying for a long time, we had Blue Putnam, the chief economist at the, at the CME on yesterday. You're saying it. So if the three of us are saying it, then it must be golden. S&Ps are popping here. Uh, but what about the turn? I mean, every, you know, people are, are talking about, well, stop going up, stable, and going lower, I don't think there's as much as there's not indications to take this market, you know, to take rates higher. On the contrary, I mean, Powell, you got to admit it. He's having his cake and he's eating it, too. He ratcheted yeah. rates up and he he hasn't busted this market here. So stable for longer instead of higher for longer. Yeah. And also, you got to remember, you're in this seasonally strong period and mid-September into October, where you do make bottoms, and sometimes they're ugly if you get a volatility event that comes out of the blue, uh, and sometimes they just take time, which is what I hope is happening right now. So especially in a pre-presidential election year, you make a low in September, late September, and then you just power ahead to a, a strong close where you're pretty much near the highs of the year. So I had been looking for 4,800 to 5,000. 
probably 4,600 to 4,800 is more realistic, but that's still seven to 10% above where we are. So uh, I'm, I'm a bull. The question is what you buy. And yeah. I think the, the big debate here is do you buy tech versus uh, industrials and energy? And I think it's tech is the winner, but energy is nipping at its heels. And uh, the only negative with energy is that when oil prices get this overextended, um, historically, that's put a lid on crude, but that doesn't, a lid on crude up in the 80, 90 area doesn't really do a lot of bad things for uh, the refiners. So I'm looking at my favorites, Valero and PSX in the uh, oil space and EQT and EOG in the natural gas space, which really hasn't had the, uh, the big push yet. But if you look at Valero and PSX, they're just barn burners. Yeah. And by the way, at, at the start of the year, we put together a list at, at the urging of uh, our affiliate Stansbury Research of what we thought the top 10 stocks in the S&P were going to be in 2023. And PSX and Valero were on that list. And if you look at what they've done since December, it, it's been a, a bit of a ride, but look where they are now. So <laughs> That's, that's, those are my two favorite investments in that space. They've turned out to be good trading stocks. And then back to tech, I love Adobe, down 4% on the Oracle earnings. That was a, I don't like to buy one day dips, particularly after a stock has been at a new high. But to me, that was a gift on uh, Tuesday after Oracle reported. And uh, it was up 2% yesterday. So I think you're just looking for pockets of, um, of selling uh, to add to uh, you know some very profitable tech positions. All right, Mark. So, do you see oil getting above one hundred? Just wanted to ask you that question, at least. Oh, it's above my pay grade. Mm, There's some there. geopolitical stuff in there. I doubt it. I really okay. doubt it. Only because of the seasonal trends for crude oil for gasoline right now are weak. Uh, it's, it's an obvious, you know, summer travel season's over, people travel less, and uh, it is really overextended. So uh, could it happen? Yeah, I, it'd be more likely to happen uh, if the dollar continues strong, but that's good. after eight straight weeks up, that's probably going to run into some resistance. So, um, but I, I think the, it's not the number it's going to reach. It is it going to maintain this level and what does that mean for profits all um, right so so far it's working where else is the power gauge looking at well it's looking away from stocks like boeing which uh and the airlines which took mm. a deep hit uh boeing the power gauge turned negative mm. um i i think selective drug stocks i'd love to be, buy eli Lilly down 10 percent from recent peaks but not sure we're going to get that chance and some industrial stocks, construction, still huge. Um, there are some construction stocks. If you believe in the AI boom, which I do, that's part of my continuing bullish thesis on Adobe, which we recommended well before it became clear that they were going to be part of the AI picture going forward. There are companies like EME, which is, we mentioned that on here before. It's a construction company, but they build some of the plants where the servers live. Huh. So there are some shadow plays to leverage uh, infrastructure needed for the servers and, um, you know, the whole AI configuration. So... Uh, EME is a stock I like. Um, Fix, air conditioning stock, I think is, is very big. And then finally, cybersecurity. I, I think cyber took a big hit when first Fortinet reported and disappointed, and then yeah. Palo Alto reported and disappointed. But uh, Fortinet has taken a little longer to rebuild. I think Palo Alto is, is one of the blue chip names in the group and CrowdStrike, which we recommended about a month ago, CRWD. Um, if I was a bottom fisher, which I'm not, I'd be accumulating uh, Fortinet on weakness, but CrowdStrike, just look at the chart. 
lower left to upper right. Remember when it was that easy, Dennis? I mean, I mean, the demand for cybersecurity stocks is just not going to go away. It's only going to increase as we continue. You know, you me talk about AI or whatever. You know, as we continue on, I mean, it's like we're all attempted to be hacked. It seems like every day, and then you see the Caesars and the MGM. I mean, uh, cybersecurity. Yeah. yeah, these stocks aren't cheap, but holy, you know, the just the demand is just going to continue to increase. As you know, this as we continue to go with tech stocks and tech and technology in our yeah. in our economy. Yeah, and the federal government's getting hacked right and left. There was a story yesterday Everything. that they're rethinking it. But the um, the MGM is. A, I'm glad you brought that up. When we wrote up Palo Alto, the story was the city is, of Las Vegas had been hacked, and so they brought in, and I'm. It was either Palo Alto or CrowdStrike, and we recommended them a week apart. And they fixed the problem. You know, four in the morning phone call to the chief technology guy, chief information guy. Well, fast forward six weeks, and MGM gets hacked. MGM Grant. So th this is a very serious problem. We've all known it, but it's starting to hit home in, a, in an economic way that yeah. is affecting not just individuals getting locked out of their data drives. Do you think so, they pay them off? Do you think like in Caesars, yeah, there's, there, the rumor is that they made a huge payday, you know, obviously, you know, the hackers. Do you think MGM was the same thing? Do you think they actually pay them off? I don't know, but I do know that they have it. If they take it in Bitcoin or something cyber related, they have a, a pretty decent way to track it back over time, you know, in time, not over time. Uh, but whether they pay them off or not, they're calling in their cybersecurity consultant the next day or that day. Yeah. So this is a great growth industry, but you do have the hiccups that come with these earnings reports. And one thing about cyber is it's a function of capital expenditures at the corporate level. And if, if capital expenditures are not top of mind, then they can defer a cyber build out. And so you get these periodic hiccups like you did with Fortinet, which wasn't a terrible quarter, but you know the, these companies are richly valued. So any hint at um, you know, a, a, a down forecast uh, contract. Hey, Mark, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we got the PPI coming up in oh, one gosh, minute I here. Go wide again. So we're going to let you go here. Okay. Mark Jakey, Checking Analytics, joining us here on Pre-Market Prep. Mitch, give us a preview as we are trading at the highs of the session. All right. So PPI for the year-over-year -year outlook expected to come in in August at 1.2 versus a 0.8 uh, prior estimate. And then when we look at core PPI year-over-year, 2.2 prior being 2.4 and the month over month outlook there is 0.2 versus a 0.3 prior we'll also get initial jobless claims and some other numbers coming in here so get ready we'll need a little bit to digest here but we'll take a look at the price action that we're seeing right now what are you seeing joel now nah, i'm seeing us at the top of a five-day trading range the top of that range comes in at 43.50 We'll see if they jam it above there and work for last week's high at 45, 70, 50. On the downside here, it's hard. Ooh, we got a little down tick here. Uh, not much. Looks like it. I'm going to go in line in here, maybe a little bit strong, selling off just a little bit as we are reaching the top of that trading range. Still kind of feel some bids out there, though, kind of like yesterday, but certainly not the drop that we had yesterday. We are getting the official numbers here. August. PPI data, retail sales, and jobless games. Mitch, what do you have for me? Um, I'm I'm a waiting here. Uh, waiting you to are get waiting here. Um, well, I'm even I'm even on the like labor similar. site. So yeah, it's there it similar. is. What do you All got? right, so PPI for final demand advances 0.7 in August. Goods rise by two percent. Services increase 0.2. Trying to get the year over year number here for you guys, but th there we go. I got. Uh, month over month is that 0.7 versus a 0.4 estimate, so pretty Ooh. high there. Initial jobless claims, 220,000 versus 225,000 estimate. A little bit hot. Uh, yeah, a little bit hot here so far. Um, let me go into the report here. I'm pretty quick at getting information here for us. Yeah, so please. I'm going to go into the report. You guys look at the price action. What are you guys seeing on the price action at first? And I'll give you guys a summary in just a second. I'm Initial. seeing it in the weird 
Yep. Yeah, go, go ahead, Joe. Dennis. No, no, no you got I didn't it, know you were still you're the, here. You're the, you're the price action guy, so give it to us. I, to me, you know, you talk about technicals, fundamentals. We were at the top of a trading range from the last six days. So there's a big level up there. We needed a good number. We didn't get a good number. They're hitting it. Not as much as they did yesterday, but, uh, you know, definitely the Bears are exerting a little bit control. What what did you see, Dennis? You're usually not back this quickly here. What are you, what are you seeing in the they, equities? They hit, and they're still hitting a bit. They're reluctantly hitting, though. So they're like, oh, yeah, it's a little hot. We better hit some stocks. But then they're like, yeah, and they're just buy the dippers beneath, though. So, again, more chop. It's not a great number. PPI, X Food and Energy, again, very similar to the CPI. That's mm-hmm. actually up, you know, if you get rid of the food and the energy. So we knew the energy had prices had gone up. You take that out and it's not bad. Retail sales up 0.6% versus 0.1%. So that's interesting. A little bit, you know, push up there um, because we've got the retail wow. sales number. But that's, you know, obviously n- not in the inflation data. So we had multiple numbers. I didn't know retail sales were coming out even. So just give me that number too. Um, I think it's a similar to the CPI, very similar, where you take out back out the food and energy. It's kind of in line, but when you get the food and energy in there, it's a little bit hot. All right. So the increase in the uh, is the largest in final demand prices since June 2022. On an unadjusted basis, the index for final demand rose 1.6%. We are we were looking there for 1.2. So that's pretty hot there. Uh, yeah. The index for final demand, less food and energy and trade services increased 0.3% the same as in July and rose 3% over the last 12 months. Uh, Within final demand goods, energy prices surged 10.5% with gasoline prices increasing by 20%. However, price for final demand foods declined 0.5%. So we saw a little bit of a drop there on food decline. Um, I I think this just shows pretty much uh, what we expected, but a little bit hotter than uh, what was already expected. We were expected to come up 0.4. We went up, what, an extra, what, an extra 0.4. So uh, essentially an increase here of 0.8 on the year-over-year outlook. It it becomes, you know, the Fed wants to be done. I think they want to be done. Um, but you know, when you get a little number, a little bit hot, it's going to put skepticism on, do we go another quarter or not? Like we're still Mm. towards the top end of this hiking cycle. cycle. I agree. We are, we're towards the top end. It's a matter of like, are we getting another quarter? Could we get another half? That's like the, the extreme, you know, do we get another quarter? Well, you get a number like this and you're like, well, maybe we could get another quarter. So, which, you know, obviously the market doesn't want. So. I'm very torn, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm the same thing. Like sometimes I come in, I'm very convicted, you know, I'm feeling it, you know, like on the Apple, you know, that, that day I was feeling like pretty convicted that yep. the stock was probably going to sell off after its event because historically it has, the technicals were setting up. Like really my trading process is I get a thought process, like a story or something, a catalyst, something going in my head. And then I kind of look to the technicals and I'm like, does it line up? And if it does line up, I usually strike. Um, in this case, it's like we're random. I don't know. Today, I'm just like, I'm not feeling it. So I think that equals more chop. Um, I think you also look for like, uh, when you're doing that, you also like catalysts. Like the big thing with the Apple was, you know, you're like, this event's going to be a flop. You know, you just like, you're like, they need it. You've been saying this for a while. You know, they need something new. Show me something new, nice and fancy. So, cool. yeah, stuff. yeah. So you had, you had a, uh, you know, you also like to throw a catalyst in there. And uh, uh, Apple, you're looking pretty good so far here. It's trading up just a tad today here. Um, everything, the only thing I see in the red a little bit is Lily. But, I mean, as that snuck into the top 10 components, I think the way things are setting up for me technically here today, I mean, I'm definitely respecting the top of that trading range. I would have liked to see a little bit more of a pop, you know, clear out some buy stops at, yeah. at that 45-40 area. They didn't do it. So, Right now, to me, we're mid-range on a session. It's important for the, the bulls make a minor stand here. Uh, but the longer this day goes and we don't punch through that 45, 39, 50, I'm just going to call it 45, 40, then, you know, a trading range is a trading range, right? Yeah. You can't you can't make something out of something that it's not there. We've been in a six-day trading range. 
Forty-five forty is the top of the trading range. You got to respect it. Does that mean you go out and short everything? No. Maybe you look to you look for your longs. You look for your longs. Look where are they you trading for, in relation? Uh, yeah, to yesterday's high. You look for your setups. But uh, kind of a bit not. I mean, you had the hit, but man, it's just the it's like yesterday. It's like we're there's a there's a little bit of a bid in here. So there we'll is. see what happens. You can't break that bit. buy the dip mentality. It's still in there. People still believe that if I buy the dip, and they may be right. People still believe, though, if I buy the dip here, I'm eventually going to be rewarded if I hold long enough. And, you know, who it's worked for basically, you know, all of time on the S&Ps. I mean, because, we, you know, we continue over the years to make new highs. There are two story stocks here that are red. You were talking about which stocks are red today. Two stand out to me, and they're both story stocks, Hewlett Packard and Visa. Let's start with the easy one HPQ here, Money Mitch, because there's a reason this is down. And it starts with W, and uh, it's it's the big guy. All right, let's get to the let's go to Visa's news here. Okay, Visa. HPQ. No, I was talking HPQ. Sorry. Okay. Uh, All right, we'll Mitch, go. Mitch, Mitch was sleeping there on the wheel, but uh, anyway, I'll I mean, I'm it. not so sleeping. Warren Buffett, I'm I'm no I'm leading. I'm ready to go into the next subject, but you're leading there, going into the next subject. That's the key here. I lead. We'll go to the next subject. The Oracle of Omaha, Warren Buffett, is in the spotlight again. Berkshire Hathaway recently crashed, cashed out a significant portion of HP stock. Warren Buffett cashed out $158 million of HP stock in the last three days. The investor's company still owns 11.7% of the PC maker, a position that's worth about $3.3 billion. Offloaded 5.5 million shares between the prices of $28 and $30. It's down 3% because he sold 4% of his position. I mean, this is how stupid this market is. Um, not saying, you know, Warren doesn't sell very often. So when he does sell, the stock's going to get hit. I tweeted it out last night early on. And the stock obviously is getting hit. I feel like it's overdone here. I mean, down 3.28%. He didn't sell out of Hewlett Packard. He still owns 11.5% of this company. He literally sold 5 million shares of 120 million share position. So let's give it some perspective. Selling off 3% on this feels like it's overdone. Uh, I remember when he bought this one, and it, it was, I mean, if you could go back, um, it was. I think it was in early 2022 and the thing had some pops and then Morgan Stanley came out and bashed it. Like I just can remember, like he never really, they, they sold it the day that he, he made the dig disclosure and that's not a good thing. And I, I just remember just like, man, this $40 area, but you know what? That's history. You guys don't want to hear that. You're taking out the low of the move. Uh, the former low of the move was 2785. So if you're inclined to try and buy the dip on this one, I like to see it get back above 2785 i'm not even going to call the resistance number because only you know this is staying down a buck on 42,000 shares uh if you want to look more on the monthlies and you're saying hey i'm a little longer term i'm going to hold out well maybe this 27 dollar area that was a low back in march at 26 uh 93 in order to fill the gap from yesterday in this one uh, you need to get up 2832. That's definitely a possibility there. That's a buck away. Plasma making a very good point just before we go on. And it's a good point. When you have a big position, he's not selling it all at once. So his concern or and, and, and potentially, you know, a concern of the markets here is that maybe there's more selling to come. So that is a good point, Plasma. You know which way he's leaning, right? You know, it, not like, buying. He didn't buy more. He ain't added no. He's not averaging, uh, uh, frowning and averaging down. He's uh, he's selling out a little bit. Some, I, I don't think he. I think it's me. And the other thing to consider here is when he started adding to this position actively, this stock was higher. I think yeah, he yeah. actually could oh, be selling sure. this at a loss. Oh, he is. So, I guarantee you, one hundred percent. Yeah, I know he bought this thing. I can remember if we go back and look at the days, uh, HPQ, it it was 40. It was popping over 40. And then uh, uh, it got submarine the next day by Morgan Stanley. I, I'm almost, I'm, I remember this almost to the T. And they jammed it and they bought it back because, you know, um, you know, because Warren is in it. But now it, that's all history now. Now we got to see if it can find some support. And we know uh, that Warren is uh, perhaps leaning towards the south side. He's definitely not buying more. 
But I think the bigger story, and one we had to do a little bit more digging on, but I think we got it here. Mitch, what's going on with Visa? Disaster stock of the day. Visa is considering conducting an exchange offer for its Class B common stock to release transfer restrictions. These changes aim to align Class B common stock in arrangement with Class A and Class C, particularly considering exposure to certain litigation. The proposed amendments require approval from the majority of outstanding shares in each class, but if approved, the exchange offer would allow Class B stockholders to convert a portion of their shares into freely tradable ones, initially up to 50%. Visa has settled the majority of litigation related to Class B shares, amounting to $6.48 billion. Down six dollars and eighty three cents. So this is a significant hit for Visa. You don't often see it go down that much. So they're obviously worried about sellers coming into this market and they're getting ahead of it here. Um, it's pretty ugly and it's been pretty much straight down, Joel. It isn't like this has been shopping around and bouncing. Mm -hmm. This has been a steady selling here, like steady Eddie seller here the entire after hours and the entire pre market session. And it's sitting near the pre market lows here. I'm not going to try to catch the falling knife on this one. Um, I think the setup in this one is, you know, here here's a stock uh, very close to an all-time high, right? Market's not at an all-time high. Um, still, you know, uh, you know, things in the market to figure out. And what the street is saying here is insiders are thinking of selling. I, I don't know how they're doing it, if they're doing it with their Class B shares or whether they're doing it, but the market is taking an indication that the big money wants to sell. And they're and they're and that's the way they're they're treating it. Now you're down at 241. You're down 683. This is a, a, a you know a pretty good moving stock. Um, not great levels to lean on here. I think the first one that you haven't hit yet is uh, 239.36 at your August 24th low. So maybe if you have a short, you want to see what happens at that area. But it doesn't feel at least. Not at this point that like just like, okay, we're just buying no matter what that goes on, we're just gonna buy the dip. At this point, it doesn't feel that way. Arm Blockbuster IPO in a move that's been making waves in the tech industry. Arm yeah. priced its IPO at $51 per share, valuing the company at a staggering $54 billion. Oh. SoftBank will still maintain about 90% ownership of the company after the IPO. And here's an interesting twist. Major ARM customers, right? Like Apple, Google, NVIDIA, and Samsung are all on board as shareholders. Even Amazon, a tech giant itself, uses ARM CPU designs in some of its server chips. But the bigger question, right, is... Does this valuation make sense for a chip company? Let's dig deeper into that shortly, right? If we take a look here, ARM's valuation would be exceedingly rich, right? The only other player that we could maybe compare it to is maybe NVIDIA. At $54 billion, ARM would carry a price-to-earnings multiple of about 104 oh my God. based on profits in, last, in the latest fiscal year. And, and you know what else here is the issue is that it's probably not going to open at 51. It's probably going to no. open up at 60 or 65 or something higher than that. Should we do this? Let, let's let's do the let everybody give their 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 thought process where the stock's going to open because we know the IPO is at 51, but they don't open there. Right now, I can see bids littered in the book, like just littered. You know, some people, somebody's been $200. I mean, that's just a marketable limit order where they just want to be filled on the opening print no matter what. But could it open at 70? Oh, I, I don't man. know. Some people are saying 100 I, bucks. I got 70 I, I, in my I, head. I, it, I, I, I am not an IPO guy. So I. I it's a it, hard it's, thing to gather. Yeah, 78. Chat's got some ideas though. 105, 69, 82, 54. I'm going with 70 bucks. Money Mitch, where are you going? Oh, he's, on my, he's on mute. He's on mute. The old mute trick, 75. Yep. 75. 75, 70. Joe, you're going to go 701. For some reason, I think it's going to, I don't know where it's going to open. I think it's going to trade at 80 somehow. I don't know if it's going to open it. Yeah. All right. So there yeah. you go. I mean, I, but I, I mean, you're, you're like, I, like I said, I think if there's anything in the market that I probably 
have less information on or no information on is this. I mean, for me, I I mean, if I was, uh, you know, any of these big shareholders, <laughs> man, I'd have offers out there. I mean, you know, stacked up, you know, 5,000, 70, 10,000 and 75, 100,000 and 80. I mean, I, I don't know. Can they sell? I mean, is there a lockup period? Can anybody sell this thing? I mean, I, I mean, that's just the way I think. At this, at those kind of valuations, wasn't someone trying to take this stock out or this company out for a while? Or did I make that up? Wasn't someone like in a deal trying to take them out? Yeah. Oh no, no for sure. It was. It was. In, wasn't it Nvidia trying to buy them years ago? Arm. Who was trying to buy Arm? No, it was I, a number of years ago. Who was trying to buy them? Yeah, I. I can't. Was it Intel? I'm no. trying to find it. I'm Googling it fast. Help us out. Nvidia. Jay I think know it was this. NVIDIA. I Jay think it was NVIDIA. This. That's what Red I'm going Bull NVIDIA. Says. Yep. Yeah. In uh, intern Toronto says NVIDIA. I think NVIDIA. Yeah, rules. It was NVIDIA. It NVIDIA was, was in to September 21. Of course, ChatGPT helping out here. NVIDIA was trying to acquire ARM. Oh, nice, Mitch. Um, and so it was NVIDIA in 2021 in September. Are they um, all over everything? Is anybody smarter than NVIDIA? Because like now you got ARM out here. They were even trying to buy ARM as well. Imagine if they had ARM too. Just imagine the power. <laughs> there, of course, the UK uh, fought back big on this. Um, that where, so yeah, yeah. that's okay. why it, it kind of just died out really quickly. They kind of knew that if they did it, it probably wouldn't go through. Man, could you imagine that powerhouse though? It's yeah, probably it would have been a powerhouse. That's through, why they already the knew. Powerhouse. So this is going to be compared to and NVIDIA. When it's publicly Lori, it. traded, it's I'm going to be pair trading ARM probably with NVIDIA. So you look here, maybe we're light at 70 on this opening price. I, it's I, going to I, be I, exciting. I ain't buying it, not buying it. Full <laughs> disclosure, I will not be trading it even, but it's fun to watch, and it's going to be fun to watch. <laughs> they typically open around 11 o'clock. So it isn't going to open at 930 Probably not going to open at 10 or 10.30. It's usually about an hour and a half after the open. So look for this third trading somewhere between 11 and 12 o'clock. And I think the opening tick's going to be $70. Dennis, how long will you wait for this to trade before, you know, like, uh, I mean, like, remember when we used to have Fari on? Hey, Fari, if you're listening, we miss you. Uh, but remember, Fari would wait like almost three months worth of data, right? And I know, Dennis, you got to. Six months, itchy. I think he does. Yeah. In six months? Six okay. months. I'll wait a week. I usually wait a, a week. week. <laughs> About a week. <laughs> I can let it calm down. I'll wait a week. Depending on what it is. If it's small cap, I'm never going to trade it at all because, you know, I don't really love small caps. But, yeah, yeah usually about a week. Um, one thing that I'll be looking, and you have NVIDIA's chart, so just make a quick comment on that. If when ARM comes out, if NVIDIA can still hold this kind of like 450 area, um, I, I, I'm looking to see if NVIDIA can just kind of hold that 450 because yesterday we broke through it. We didn't break it on any downside action. So that's kind of a level that I'm just keeping a watch on for NVIDIA. Let's go to uh, the time. I just, wanted right, to go ahead, Jay, I just wanted to throw Jay's comment in here because yeah. I remember when he talked about what, what's the, uh, uh, what is it? VinFast? Is that uh, VFS? <laughs> is that what, is that one? <laughs> He, yeah, uh, we didn't do too he bad. mentioned this to today and he said he waited uh to the option started trading on it. And then once you get the option boys in there and you know making uh you know making a market premium and you know getting advantage, taking advantage of that. So <laughs> and I think that's uh that is it five days afterwards, or I think before they get I mean, I'm sure no one's touching the options market. They have to wait a certain amount of time. So, you know, maybe, you know, maybe wait, wait for that to open, see what kind of technical setup it is, because I believe, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Jay, I think this day that it topped up over $90 was the day that the options started trading on. Don't quote Spinner me on it. it. Yeah, he did. Jay, That's what Jay, it, Jay in the chat called it. It's one of the best the one, calls of like, the year. I, that was one of his best calls. I mean, he's made some awesome calls for us over the years, but that was one of his best calls, man. Could be he tomorrow, he said. He said, look okay. out. I remember the message in our chat, in the pre-market chat. And this is why we read the chat. We learned so many. There's so many good traders in our chat. But it was that day. VFS was up there at $90. And yep. Spinner saying, look out. Options are coming out today. And this stock actually could get hit because the options are out now. And that was the next. That was on the eight on the 
just there on the 29th there. And it stock tanked, obviously, after that. Time is ticking right here. The auto industry labor negotiations. What's going to happen today? Contract expires at 11.59 p.m. Eastern. Uh, Detroit automaker Ford CEO was out saying that uh, saying that they received no genuine counteroffer. Um, he was even kind of attacking the, the president yeah. of the UAW. He was yeah. saying that uh, he was too busy, worried about press conferences and get planning for the strike than worrying about actually giving them a real counter offer. Seems like things are getting rough here after just recently Ford said that they were getting some progress. I don't think this happens today. No. I think we get the strike. That's there, why yeah. I'm going to be watching today to potentially go short on Stellantis. Not short yet. But I'm thinking about it. It, it's uh, they're striking. I'm with you 100. percent They're not getting this deal done. You can read, you know, just the lines. Like you don't have to read. Like Mus says, you don't even have to read between the lines. You can read the lines here. I mean, they're they're ticked off that you know they're they're full on striking here. Obviously, it's not going to be every plant that shuts down. They're talking. You know, we're talking about the different plants that are going to strike, so they're going to rotate them. But they're striking. They're they're not the, uh, the deal will eventually get done and there will eventually be a relief pop here. I don't think there's going to be a significant sell off in these stocks on the news that they're striking because everybody knows they're striking. I think a lot of it is priced in. Joel's mentioned that before. You have good support on GM and Ford. My bigger concern is that these automotive we're companies ripping. we're ripping. Dennis, watch your offers here. We are ripping. Did we have something else come out here? We are just blasted off to a new high of the session here. Nice. Do we have? Do we have anything breaking on this? Sorry to interrupt you, but I just don't want you getting picked off. No, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Um, we're ripping. I don't know what happened. Uh, Just real quick on the auto show. uh, Just uh, uh, if you're looking at any articles on the on the auto show, you got to look at who took the picture. Okay, and uh, this Emily is covering it for Bloomberg. Uh, That's my uh, youngest daughter attending. Yeah. Yep. So. Let's uh, look at the auto show. I don't know what to think Congrats. about this. Strike, no strike. I mean, I don't know. They, I, I've just kind of been talking my mind, you know, down here that if you're thinking of shorting this thing, I mean, what if they come out and settle? Boom. It's going to get a pop. So hopefully they will settle. We, you know, we don't, we don't want it. It's not good for the Motor City, and it's definitely not good for the economy. Not that the biggest part of the economy, but it's still part of the economy and it also pertains to your know, wages, right? Wage inflation. We, you know, we haven't had a, what a PCE number in a while. So, um, you know, pros and cons on that one, GM and uh, Ford, both off their lows of the move. I think Ford stuck something in yesterday about the Ford lightning, uh, something with uh, the truck. Maybe it can go farther than 150 miles or something like that. Yeah, uh, we, we, we looked at that yesterday. No one's buying that thing. Um, but uh, Etsy upgrade. Finally, a bit of good news for Etsy as Wolf Research upgrading the online marketplace mm. to outperform, announcing a hundred price target on it. What's driving this optimism? Should investors take notice? What do you guys think? Mm. I'll let you Stock touch has this. Been one. in the gutter, massively <laughs> over. This was a hard one, man. <laughs> massively oversold. Stock just continues to go down. So you have literally everybody cop. With that being said, it was a hundred dollars a month ago. So you said you this know, you yesterday. Popped to seventy-five, and the bears are still in complete control. So I don't think it's investable. No, I don't think it's investable at this point in time. I do think you could, you know, get. You know, this this could get it started, and I'm not surprised it's up 4% on this. We talk about what's an upgrade worth. Well, nobody had the guts to upgrade this, so this upgrade is worth a lot. So <laughs> is it worth 5 6 7%? I think it could be. I think you could even see $70. But, um, again, so much overhead supply, it's hard to be, you know, buying this thing. We like these kind of calls, though, right? We love them. They're not, they're not, they're not lemming calls, right? Guts. Guts, man. This guy's probably comes out from no one's heard much from him over at Wolf Research. They don't even know. He's probably been working from home. Shows up at the office and says, time to buy Etsy. Uh, pre-market high is we're just off the pre-market high. We almost ticked 68 bucks, but I'll just, you, you got reference points here. And if the bulls really want to take this up and take it through, first uh, target would be, wow, your first target, 67.81. That's right near the pre-market high. That's your three-day high. And then you could just walk it up. 69.39, 7201, 
70, wow, a lot of lower highs here. So catalyst, right? Price at Dennis, actually, we had the pre pre-market show, you said, you know, I was thinking of buying this one. And I'm looking, that's one of the most horrible looking charts that I've seen in a while. But that's just, you go, know, you're going feel, right? So if you would have been watching that news when that broke, you know, yeah, the you might have you might have lifted an offer because there was you had an idea, but you did have the catalyst. Wolf Wolf Research provides you with the catalyst. So is it Wolf? File through. I yeah. thought it was Wolf, isn't it? Yeah, it is. What what's going on with Delta? Could you guys just? I'm gonna look real quick here for news. That's trading up 95 cents. Bad news yesterday. Uh, quarter revenue growth upper half. All right, so these other companies come out. Wow. Look at that, Dennis. Delta comes in and says, well, so are you guys still holding your AAL? I mean, bad news yesterday. Yeah, I'm holding good it. Good news. Yeah, good news yet. Yeah, but it's not news. great news. So they cut their guidance. So Delta it here, it's fun. Yeah, they yeah, lowered the, the Q3 up. EPS from to $1.85 from $205. They previously guided $220 to $250. But you know what? They're the second company, third company to do this now. So like, oh, it's not that bad. <laughs> so if you want a lower guidance, you always want to be the second one doing it, not the first one. That's a tip to all you corporate executives out there. You're in a tough industry and feel price going up. Don't be the first to lower guidance. Be the second to lower guidance. Your stock can actually rise on it. And there you go. That's why well, the stock is up. This is the sign of confidence, right? They're saying that it's expected to be in the upper half of the initial guidance compared to what we got yesterday, which was the lower half of the initial guidance. Of the initial guidance, but they're still That's guiding good. down from where they went 220 to 250, which felt like a month ago. I mean, I remember him on CNBC tooting his horn and saying how awesome everything state. was. Yeah, it, it, it was. It was two months ago. CEO was on CNBC saying how right awesome here. they were doing, how they were just rocking it. <laughs> and they raised their guidance up to 220 to 250. So now they go back. To their old guidance and then the upper range of their old guidance, but it's still buck 85 to 205 when you were talking about 250. I mean, holy two months, man. I guess I couldn't predict that fuel prices would rise that much, though. So it's all they hedge, though. I thought Delta did some hedging. I, I, no, I apparently did. not, or they wouldn't I, I, be doing this. LUV always hedged. Love was a big one hedger. Love was the one. Um, I'll Love tell you was right always now. a major head, hedger Southwest. I'll I don't you, know. I, some of them was... hedge, some of them don't hedge perfectly, some of them hedge a bit. Oh, look at love. Whoo, man. Oh, man. They never recovered from all those flight cancel. Wow. Look at that. Love uh, at the low. But I will tell I love Delta. I fly Delta all the time. And I was a on uh, last uh, is it last Saturday. No, it'll be two weeks ago on Saturday. I was able to stream the Michigan game on Peacock on Delta. So I like Delta. That was it was unbelievable. All right, Mitch, what do you got? Uh, Want to wrap things up here? I'll just give my final wrap right now, and then we can get something from Dennis. I told you an area of resistance. You just went there this morning at uh, forty-one fifty. We're knocking on the door here of uh, breaking out of a six-day yes, trading chart, range. Yes, chart, Joel. Yes, chart for me. Okay, uh, right just here. Just so we can see what your point yeah, is. Yeah, sorry about that. Right here. Here's your trading range. Right, forty-three fifty was your high here. So. We got a chance. I drew those lines in yesterday. Well, we'll see if we got another leg higher in the S and P's. Let's establish a strong bid over forty five forty. If you wanted to buy the dip, you missed the opportunity when you had a fifty percent retracement on this session. What do you got for me, Dennis? Uh, I think it's kind of more chop. I'm going to stick with the chop theme. Rallies okay. be sold, dips maybe be bought. Maybe we just go sideways for the win. Guess for tomorrow, Joel. Guess for tomorrow. On quad which expiration will be CC Legator. Mm. He will be talking about the volatility and just making things simple for us dummies CC's here. That don't, Joel, yeah, a, ask great. him a question in advance. Ask him when would uh, options open for ARM? That'd be a good okay. question to Jay maybe said ask it may, Jay, Jay, Jay said it may be tomorrow, but I'll tell you right now, you better have some capital if you want to do that. But, uh, but uh, go ahead, Mitch. Let's uh, let's wrap things up for today. All right. I'm going to go ahead and bring Dennis and Joel in the background, wrap it up, and bring you guys over to checking out, of course, our FinTech event. Check it out, guys. The FinTech Awards. I want to tell you guys all about it. Here's the link if you guys want to know more about the FinTech Award. And here's a little trailer to tell you exactly and why you don't want to miss it. <laughs> 